In Europe and elsewhere, a lot of research is done to improve computer memory capacity. In this miniaturization race, engineers at Seagate have produced a read-write head, just a few atoms thick. On this scale, the magnetic pole variations in each atom can be used to store encoded data. This has enabled hard disk capacity to be increased tenfold. Even so, research is moving so fast that other competing systems are already being developed. Elsewhere in Europe, researchers are exploring a completely different method in which molecular robots convert matter using matter itself. In Toulouse, the process begins with ordinary chemical reactions, presented more than succinctly by one of the project team. Donc voici la molécule qu'on a obtenue après cette étape de synthèse. Donc c'est la molécule à quatre pattes qu'on va ensuite visualiser par le microscope. On en a introduit des milliards de milliards de molécules alors qu'en théorie, il suffirait d'une seule. These four white marks are an electron microscope image of the molecule and here is a more detailed representation. Pushed by the tip of the tunnel effect microscope, it moves rubbing against the surface. Successive images are needed to check that it has really been displaced. Mission accomplished. To make this movement more precise, researchers are trying to modify the initial structure of the molecule by adding paddle wheel extensions. Ça joue le rôle un peu d'engrenage. Ça bute contre un atome et ça tourne. Throughout Europe, scientists are working on many other types of nanorobot, which may be able to move hundreds of thousands of molecules at once, where the tip of the tunnel effect microscope can only handle one at a time, although other avenues are also being explored. Au lieu d'avoir à fabriquer ces objets d'une manière de plus en plus difficile et onéreuse, n'y a-t-il pas moyen de mettre en œuvre cette propriété de la matière qui est une propriété, j'aime, c'est pas mystérieux, parce que pour la science, il n'y a pas de mystère, il y a simplement de l'inconnu. Mais cette propriété qui est certainement présente et qui pousse en quelque sorte la matière à s'organiser. In quite another field of research, Harold Croto's team have stumbled on a new spontaneously formed structure of matter. While studying the origin of the universe and trying to reproduce deep space chemical reactions in the laboratory, they came across a molecule that is frankly amazing. We found the carbon chains and we explained how these chains came to be in space, but there was a big surprise at the same time we discovered this beautiful uh, cage of carbon and 60 carbon atoms, which is this one here, uh, it has 60 carbon atoms. Named fullerene is a new structure of carbon, an element that takes the form of charcoal, pencil lead or diamonds. A Japanese team completed the picture with a structure very similar to fullerene, the carbon nanotube. The mechanical property is determined by how these two atoms are connected to each other, how strongly they are connected. So in the diamond case, this connection is very strong. The this the uh, carbon nanotube, the connection is even stronger than the diamond. It has basically half of C60 at this end and half of C60 at that end, and then is a tube of, of graphite, a flat sheet which is rolled into a tube. To obtain nanotubes, take two pure carbon graphite electrodes connected to a DC generator in an atmosphere of helium, an inert gas that does not react with carbon. At 4,000 Celsius, the graphite fuses and matter torn from the electrode on the left is deposited on the right-hand one, forming nanotubes. After cooling, they can be collected from the freshly produced tip. There are hundreds of thousands of nanotubes here, so small that the knife doesn't damage them. Forming 90% of this powder, they are only visible through a microscope. This long structure spanning the screen measures about 5 to 10 microns in length for 10 to 40 nanometers in diameter. Now the amazing thing about this material is that it is perhaps the strongest object that has ever been made, this tube. 
And now you have a material that if you could put them in, in bundles of maybe a million, or maybe much more than that, a million, million, million of these, you will have a, a material which is a um, hundred times stronger than steel and one sixth the weight. Nanotubes look set to take over from the superannuated steel, but that's not all. Since they're perfect electrical conductors too, they'll certainly provide a major boost for the computer revolution. Certain of these tubes are what we call ballistic conductors. They conduct without loss. They're not superconductors, but that means that whatever you put in this end gets to the other end. And that means that these incredibly thin um, sort of light wires could replace the copper wires, aluminium wires that we use today in transmitting electricity and with zero loss. El modelo más sencillo es el siguiente. Pensemos que tenemos un sistema unidimensional y que consideramos cada una de estas bolas como uno de los electrones. Entonces nosotros tenemos nuestro electrodo de la derecha y de la izquierda y lo que queremos es transportar corriente de un lado al otro. Entonces, normalmente, ¿qué es lo que ocurre clásicamente? Clásicamente, que es lo que se denomina transporte difusivo, el electrón se inyecta en la muestra y tenemos los, los átomos, están vibrando y hay impurezas. Entonces, el electrón lo que hace es un proceso de movimiento de zig-zag y de repente choca con los fonones y se vuelve hacia atrás. Entonces, tiene un proceso difusivo, no va directamente. Entonces, ¿Qué es lo que ocurre cuando hacemos un transporte de tipo balístico? Balístico quiere decir que inmediatamente cuando inyectamos un electrón, el otro sale en el otro extremo. Entonces tenemos una conducción sin pérdida de energía en el conductor. It is precisely these perfect conduction properties that have led researchers at Delft University in the Netherlands to use nanotubes to make microprocessors. Als je zo'n nanobuisje hebt, dan heb je een een atoombrooster daarop zitten van allemaal hexagonen van koolstofatomen. En als je goed kijkt, zie je dat zo'n rij atomen een, 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 een hoek maakt met het buisje. En die eigenschap die is essentieel voor de elektronische eigenschap van die nanobuisjes. To make use of these properties accurately positioning millions of nanotubes on silicon chip components would be too time consuming and tricky. So paradoxically, Keystecker's team are trying to accomplish this precision task using the benefits of pure chance. Hier hebben we de nanobuisjes, hier gaan we ze op een chip neerleggen. En het nanobuismateriaal zelf, dat ziet er heel uh, korrelig uit. Een beetje zwart spul. Yeah. Normaal stoppen we dat in een vloeistof en leggen we een druppel daarvan op een oppervlak. En dat gaat Kees Williams van mijn groep nu laten zien. To make a sample, it's quite simple. Just use a pipette. Take the nanotubes out. Like so. And just put them on the surface. And then the next step is just to rinse off the excess solution. It looks like everything is gone, but in fact, there are a lot of nanotubes left on the surface. And then finally, just dry off the water. Now, what we nu doen met dat druppeltje, is we hebben in dat druppeltje al die nanobuisjes uh, lopen. En dat laten we vallen op het oppervlak. Dus dan komen ze op het oppervlak terecht, op die chip. En een heleboel van die nanobuisjes die komen ernaast terecht. Maar een enkele nanobuis die gaat precies tussen die twee elektrodes zitten ook. En als we dus een droge chip hebben gemaakt, hebben we die nanobuis. En kunnen we dus elektrisch transport meten van hier naar hier. 